Any more meetings? Sure, sure. Okay. Whenever you want. Uh, are you going to introduce me or should I just go ahead? Mm -hmm. It's up to you. Okay, I'm fine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Shane, first of all. And this is an awesome opportunity for me because I'm a PhD student from Canada. And uh, most of the conferences I attend are for research. And this is like, you know, ah, actual stuff is happening here. So it's, it's kind of neat. Um, yeah, so thanks for welcoming me. My talk is about uh, identifying hotspots in the Postgres build system. Actually, before I start, uh, here's my Twitter handle, and this would be really awesome for me in my future research if um, you guys could actually take a look at my Twitter handle. I just tweeted out a link, and it's a, a survey, a developer survey. It'll take maybe five minutes of your time. Uh, to fill out, and uh, it's just about uh, how you interact with build systems and these sorts of things. And it really helped me direct my future work if, if you could fill that out for us. Anyways, back to the task at hand. So we did some work uh, identifying hotspots in the Postgres build system. And I find it, it's usually useful for me to take a few minutes to explain what I mean by a build system before I start digging in because there's kind of uh, overlapping terms. Everybody thinks something different when I say build system. So if we imagine that this pile of Lego, pile of blocks, is the source code of a software project, and this spaceship is what we want to deliver to our customers, well, uh, the build system is the set of order-dependent in instructions that take us from the blocks to the actual spaceship. Or in software terms, it's the make files and configuration scripts, these sorts of things that describe how source code and tech files, documentation files are translated into deliverables and then packaged. And we've been using build systems, developers have, for quite some time now. Um, since the 70s, the original make tool came out and this concept of the developer's work cycle as thinking of the code, thinking of something you want to change, editing the code to implement the change, running the build to integrate the change into the deliverables, and then testing what you've produced. And then you circle back around. But in this model, all builds were thought of as equal. So anytime I ran the build, it was just doing the build step. But in reality, some builds are more equal than other builds. So some builds actually take longer than other ones do. And this uh, recent XKCD comic kind of highlights that, saying that one of the number one reasons for developers slacking off is the code is compiling. So they're waiting for the build to actually complete. And we've got some quotes from GTK developers who say, you know, the build is abysmally slow and it's preventing them from being able to get their job done. So. Slow builds are actually impacting people, or that's the impression that we get. So what can people do to, to address build performance in the wild? So if refactoring is a common technique. So if we imagine that uh, we have a four file system, a very simple system made up of four C files, and uh, we notice that 
this particular file, when we change it, takes a while to, to reintegrate. Because first, we need to recompile this object file, then re-archive it, and then it gets linked into two deliverables. So before refactoring this source tree, four commands are triggered when you change util1.c. However, if we look at this graph and we find out that util.c <coughs> is only ever used in the first deliverable, it's never used in the second one, we can actually refactor this code to look something like this. Where now, if util.c is changed, only one compile command is triggered, and then one deliverable is relinked. So now only two commands are triggered, and we've shaved our compile time in half. But the question is now, I'm working on, imagine I'm working on a real system that's not four files. Where do I focus my effort? Where should I look for gains to refactor? And we thought, the most obvious one is look for the files that are the slowest to rebuild. Find the turtles. So we came up with a pretty <coughs> simple two-step approach to finding them, to finding the slow files. So first step, we extract the dependency graph from your software system. And the way that we do that, I'll explain in the next slide. The second step is we analyze that graph to find out where the, the slow files are. So Going into each step in a little bit more detail, in the, first, in the first step, we're constructing the dependency graph. So we use this tool called Macau, which is a tool that will parse a debug trace of a build, and it'll understand recursion as well, and piece together the dependency graph. So what I'm showing here is actually uh, Postgres 9.2.4, which is probably ancient for you guys now, but um, that's the version that we studied. Um, and this is the dependency graph. So on the outside edges are uh, the source files. So these are the ones that there's no command to generate them. And then as you work closer in, that's where things are getting compiled and linked and these sorts of things. So yeah, we have this tool to build this graph. Now, in that graph, we don't have a cost for an edge yet. So we could look at that graph and just say the cost of recompiling a file is just all of the edges that get triggered. But instead, we decided to do something a little bit more practical and look at how, how much each edge costs. So how long each compile, each link, and everything costs. So we did 10 clean rebuilds of Postgres and timed each command. And then we take the median of those 10 runs, and that's the cost for each edge. So now we've got a, a nice way of finding out how, how much it costs to rebuild a file. So we said, let's try this out. So we picked three systems, and we said, let's find the slowly rebuilding files. So before I dive in, here are some characteristics of those big graphs for these systems. At the bottom here, highlighted in yellow, is Postgres 9.2.4. We also looked at glib, and we looked at Qt. And I'm showing in blue the number of edges, or sorry, the number of nodes. So these are files. So this would be like .c files, .o files, executables, libraries, these sorts of things. And then the red uh, bars are edges, or dependencies, and the rules that trigger. So you can see we looked at three systems with three different orders of magnitude of edges. So uh, up here, QT was the largest. It had over 2.7 million edges in their build dependency graph. Postgres has about 121,000. And then GLib, or sorry, Postgres is the smallest down here. GLib had 121,000. Um, so yeah, so we said, now let's go through each one of the source files so that the nodes on the outside of that big graph that have no in edges and uh, trace through the graph to see how much it would cost to rebuild each file. And then we plotted graphs that look like this. So on the left hand side are the C files, on the right hand side are the header files, and each point on the graph is one file, and we sorted it according to uh, build cost. So 
the stuff on the far right is the stuff that took longest to recompile. So we saw some interesting things here, like for example, down here is where we would expect most .c files to be, triggering one compile and maybe a couple of links. But there were uh, these jumps in the GTK build where some C files actually triggered several uh, compile commands and several link commands as well. So we dug in and found that they had some code generators there where if you changed that C file, it would end up regenerating some code and then recompiling and linking some stuff. So yeah, there was some interesting stuff there. Um, here on the header files, you can see there are, again, steps. Some of these header files were included in the source code generator, which meant that they would trigger the same sort of activity. And as you would expect, on the y-axis at the top here, C files, if you touch them, tend to uh, rebuild very quickly. Maybe 12 seconds is the top here. Whereas if, you, if you're touching header files, you pay a higher price. <coughs> this is what Postgres looked like, which was much more, uh, I guess, flat, what we expect. Uh, touching C files never really took more than two seconds to recompile. But we found that if you did touch some, some of the bad header files, it could take more than three minutes to recompile. And when we turned to QT, this is where we said, oh boy, these guys are in trouble. Because uh, there are some C files that actually took almost three minutes to recompile, and there are some header files that took over two hours to recompile. So if you, if you were unlucky enough to have to touch one of those, it would take forever to fix uh, whatever you were working on. But in any case, we said, this is great. You know, we, we can sort this stuff, we can find the files that are really slow to rebuild, all we have to do to find the stuff you should focus on for refactoring is just draw a simple line. I don't want to wait more than 100 seconds for my code to rebuild, so everything above this line, I need to look at refactoring. Or maybe you're more patient than me and you say 150 seconds, or maybe you're less patient and you say 50 seconds. But either way, all we have to do is draw a line. We said, great, so let's pick an arbitrary line, something we felt was bad was 90 seconds. We read some books and 90 seconds seems to be how long people say developers are willing to wait. So we sent a list of these header files or C files that took longer than 90 seconds to the glib developer uh, mailing list. And we asked them, of these files, do you think any of them are performance bottlenecks? And we got some scary responses. Somebody said, for all of them, no. None of them are hotspots. We, we don't care about those files. <laughs> They're not painful at all. Then we asked them why. He said, because none of these files change that often. So we went back to the drawing board. Originally we said, let's look for the slow files. Maybe it's not the slow files that are the bottlenecks. Because they might only rarely change, right? So if they only rarely change, people don't have to pay the price of rebuilding them. So maybe what we should be looking at are the files that change the most often. So we said, oh, okay, how are we going to find the files that change the most often? We turned to the version control system, and we did some simple mining. We just looked at, uh, for example, for each file, the number of uh, changes that had happened. And we assumed that files that changed a lot in the past will continue to change a lot in the future. So. Then we said, okay, let's build those same graphs, draw a line there. What we found is that many of these files already built very quickly. So we thought, okay, th that's not going to work either. So focusing on the files that change the most often also isn't sufficient because they may already be optimal. There's not much you can do to refactor a file that builds in less than a second. So what we suggest is that instead of trying one or the other, you should focus on both. So we call these files build hotspots. They're the files that rebuild slowly, but also they change frequently, so people have to pay that cost of rebuilding a lot. So we took this two-step approach that we originally had and turned it into a three-step approach. So we added a third step where we took the version control stats that we mined, 
integrated it with the stuff we pulled from the dependency graph to get what we call a quadrant plot. And this is a, a pretty simple concept. We just take the rebuild cost and the number of changes for each file and plot them against each other on X, Y grid. So each one of these dots would represent one of the files in your system. And then we split it into quadrants. So based on thresholds that you pick for your project, you say, I'm not willing to wait more than 90 seconds, 100 seconds, 20 minutes, whatever it is. That's your threshold for rebuild cost. And then you pick a threshold for the number of changes. So 10 changes in the past is a lot, or 100 changes in the past is a lot. And that becomes your threshold. And then we just say, focus on this red area. Those are the files that you want to rebuild. Those are the files that you want to refactor first. So we said, great. Now we've got a metal detector. Let's go try it out on some open source systems and see what kind of hotspots we detect. So for this, we had to pick some thresholds. Like I mentioned, we had been playing with 90 seconds because we read in some books that that's a pretty good threshold. And we also needed to pick a number of changes for the threshold, and for that we picked the median. So anything that changes more than the median number of changes for a file in your project, we consider that a frequently changing file. So some of the things that we found using quadrant plots for the three systems, the three open source systems that we had been exploring. Uh, so about 7% of GTK, or sorry, GLibs, uh, code base was identified as a hotspot using those uh, thresholds. So about 65 glib files. And some, some of the things we found are that you don't actually have to refactor all 65. Sometimes they'd all bottleneck into one place and there were some main culprits, we said, that you could, uh, you could focus on. What I've noted here is that the maximum amount of time it takes to rebuild is about uh, two and a half, two and a half minutes there for, uh, for glib. When we turned to QT, the poor guys with the, the two hour long build, we found that uh, there were a lot of hotspots, 732 or so, but it was roughly 8% of the source code files, so on par with what we were seeing in, uh, in glib. Uh, as far as main culprits, we started trying to manually analyze this stuff to find some main culprits, but it, it just 732 files was too much for us as uh, outsiders looking in. We weren't really familiar with their system, so. Instead, what we did is we found the, the components or just the directories that had uh, the highest hotspot concentrations. So these are like, of the files in that directory, how many of them did we find as hotspots? And some of them with really high percentages were the core library and the XML patterns one. But again, yeah, they had uh, a really bad scenario where you could have files that were rebuilding very, very slowly. Then we turned to Postgres and uh, we found that only 2% of the files are actually hotspots here. So good job to those of you who are Postgres developers. Way to go. Uh, 27 hotspots though, we still found 27 hotspots here. And uh, in the worst case, uh, it was just, just over three minutes to rebuild <laughs> some of these hotspots. Uh, so some of the main culprits that we identified are here, these five files. So actually, if, you, if these five files were tackled internally, uh, most of these hotspots would actually disappear. So if I, I kind of shift now to what we learned from doing all of these studies on hotspots, it's that uh, it, they kind of highlighted this transitive trend for, for hotspotness, if I could make up a term. Um, so if we imagine that we have a, an object file that gets linked into a huge list of deliverables, a huge list of uh, DLLs and executables, and this file changes frequently, we would flag it as a hotspot. So this, this, this C file here would be considered a hotspot. But if this C file actually ended up including a header file, this header file can actually, changing this header file can trigger the same amount of build activity. So it's gonna end up having to recompile that object file, relink everything. 
And now if this header file also changes frequently, it's also going to be a hotspot. But that's not it. If this header file is also included in another header file, and that header file includes several other header files, and some of those are also hotspots, <coughs> we've got what we call a super hotspot. So this, this, changing this file will actually trigger three hotspots to recompile, which then keeps getting compounded the further up you go. So the advice we have here is that you should try to limit the use of these header file hubs. So header files that just include other header files, because they tend to accumulate build uh, activity. And if they change frequently, now these become hotspots. So just to quickly sum up what I've been talking about. Um, so we started out saying what I meant by a build system. It's the set of order-dependent tasks that have to be executed in order to translate your source code and your documentation into something that your customers or your users need. And developers rely on the build system to be quick so that they can make their edits, change their deliverables, and test them quickly to keep that feedback loop fast. But there are some files that end up taking longer than others to rebuild, and they can really interfere with developers. So what we set out to do was come up with a way of finding these files so that you can refactor them and improve your build performance. So we first started out trying to find just the files that rebuild slowly. That didn't work out so well. We tried the files that changed the most often, which also didn't work out so well, but when they were combined, so we call these files build hotspots. And they're the ones that rebuild slowly, but also take a long uh, change, change very frequently. And we came up with an approach to find these files based on thresholds. Finally, we did, we did some open source studies using our approach, found some hotspots, and found some general trends that we think could help avoid making build hotspots. So that's, uh, that's all I've got to say about build hotspots for now. I'd be happy to take questions from you guys. But at the same time, I'd like <coughs> to remind you again that uh, we put a survey up. And it's a, you can find it at my Twitter link. It would be really helpful to, to me, and we'd be happy to feed back the results to you guys if you could take the five minutes to fill out the survey. Thanks again for your attention. And, uh, yeah. Are there any questions for Shane? I keep, yeah, so please. I was wondering how you measure this. Uh, were you using the parallel build, single process build business? Yeah, this was just single process. But one of the things we want to look at is using this, this graph, we can actually find how make would parallelize things, and we can actually find um, like problems that way. My experience nowadays is that even if you have to compile everything, it's not so bad because parallelize pretty well. Oh, okay. Even when you're using recursive make, have you had any problems with that? Well, it seems to be fast enough. Oh, okay. <laughs> ah, cool, cool. Uh, it's, yeah, using, I mean, I know that recursive make isn't, it doesn't parallelize as well. As oh, okay. Otherwise, but it's good enough. Ah, ah, thanks. Um, I guess there's one other thing before we go into uh, questions any further. So my supervisor, my PhD supervisor is here, he's at the back, and he's organizing a workshop on release engineering. So maybe he can tell you a couple of words about, sure. about this. Yeah, so, uh, last year, so last year we had the workshop in San Francisco, the Valencia workshop, which actually aims not just at build systems, we had release engineering in, in, in general. So integration, version control, uh, cloud, puppet, uh, uh, and all these kind of things. Um, this year we're doing it again because it was, it was quite a big success. We had people from Google and LinkedIn, Netflix, uh, also from open source there. And uh, this time will be hosted uh, by Google in Mountain View. Um, the, the, the deadline is February 28th. So you can send like a short, small uh, abstract there, give it up. The event itself is 11th of April. 
Um, we have already a tier speaker from Google, Dina uh, Mehmet, over there. And there's another speaker coming up. It's big So anyway, so the headline is still open, so feel free to submit. And, uh, Another question. Oh, sure, sure. I was wondering, you had the quote about the GPK on board. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering, do they really do incremental builds so that they can build next genes? Um, I believe so. I believe, yeah. 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 I think in our case, it's probably not so much the build for Postgres that's the issue. Because generally, on a, even on a modern laptop or a Mac like that with an SSD, Postgres will build in a couple of minutes, yeah. right. usually. Thanks so um, well on my Raspberry Pi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we keep meaning to buy you something. Okay. Um, the, the bigger problem for us is actually, I would, I would say, running the regression tests, mm -hmm. because that takes orders of magnitude longer than, than actually building the code on those systems. Um, for the GTK guys and the QT guys, yeah, I mean, I've, I've built those, those packages myself, and, yeah, they're horrendously slow. Right. Yeah. Um, I can see how you know you could make a real difference to their their daily work. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. For us, I think it's for me at least it's more the regression tests. Okay. <coughs> so your regression tests are they smart enough to know only this stuff has changed? I should only run this subset, or do you just run the whole suite? No, you it run runs the whole suite oh. every time. Uh, there's work on it, or attempted work on it. Yeah, I mean... Andrew just the JSON stuff. Yes. Really? Yeah. I haven't really been following that thread. Um, uh, within the company I work for, we have a vastly expanded regression test suite, and we have sort of subsets of it that we can run at any one time. Uh, but the main Postgres one, and I think it's just still the standard parallel and yeah. serial schedule, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not too bad. It takes a few minutes on a laptop. Uh, there are more tests if you run all the isolation tests and stuff. Just take a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. like How frequently do you run the tests? Do you run them after every change? Or? Um, well, we run automated builds for the installers that, that my team looks after. Uh, and we run regression tests as part of every build every night. And if we trigger a manual build, um, <coughs> the, but for the Postgres project, we also run a, a website called buildfarm.postgresql.org, um, where we have lots of volunteers that provide time on their, their machines. So they run a small client that will do a get checkout, build the code, run the regression tests, and there's a couple of different ways we can run them. Runs the regression tests across the contrib modules as well. And then reports the results into the build farm website so that we can see if anything has broken the build on any particular platform. So I think there's we've got about 30 different animals at the moment. Yeah. Um, different machines, architectures, compilers, Options. combinations of them. Um, and most of those are running at least one build daily. Probably in most cases they're running one build of each branch daily. But that's pretty distributed of course. I mean, you know, I'm running a couple of machines, Hayden's probably running his graph and fight to death on it. Um, <laughs> so overall none of us really see a huge problem there. I, I guess the, the bigger problem is when you know when the bulk is running the regression test but after making a change. Um, Change the tests. Um, 
Yeah, I don't think with Postgres we're, we're at anything like the stage where it would be worth us doing doing that right now. Certainly with the stuff that we run within the company I work for, we, we have some of our test suites on certain platforms can take close to 24 hours to run even on modern hardware. Mm -hmm. And there, that, that might be an interesting approach that we should look at. I have a question. Can all this process be kind of summarized or automated in, in terms that you have a code branch and you just run through some kind of scripts or, or, or a piece of software that can identify what was kind of uh, self-contained, so to say? So at this stage, it's still a research prototype, which means it's not automated at all and it's just me tweaking things. Uh -huh. But uh, yeah. It, it could very much be automated. The, the step that takes a while is the 10 clean rebuilds just to make sure that we've got the right cost for each edge. But that's again a trade-off, right? You could build once and say that's the cost and then every time you rebuild you record again. But yes, um, essentially every, every step that I do manually right now could be done with a script or automatically. Because there is always at risk that uh, at some point somebody can include a couple of edge libraries or something like that that could end up and it would be very different, difficult for, to trace back when you have a community developing the software. So it's kind of uh, would be useful to have a like, tool that can actually <coughs> go to the source at, at some stage and, and, and give a report on after every big change or, or every big yeah, yeah, that, that's that's interesting. Yeah, it could even be integrated with like a continuous integration server to make sure that every change you see what the impact is on Fodspotness to keep coin on my same turn. Yeah, that would be very interesting. Like, so I will borrow one of the one of the posters and spend some effort splitting up every class a year ago. But, so I'm not sure. If that's actually included in 9.2. So mm. my country might look different. Uh, we can do, do it for 9.2. It for 9 the, the project does tend to do it every two or three years. Somebody will sit down and just clean up all the header files and remove unnecessary includes. So it's interesting to have a tool like this to see, and, you know, when you do yeah. that, see if you actually made any difference. It would be nice to get that as a, a step in the build farm plan. <laughs> We should uh, exchange emails. <laughs> I, can, I can help you out with that, definitely. Um, I guess I also, since I've still got some time, I had some bonus slides which name the... So I mentioned there were five kind of uh, main culprits. These are the ones that, through the chain of uh, including, 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 end up being hotspots because of that. So I don't know if any would jump out at you off the top of your head as being recently cleaned up. But yeah, so some five files get dragged in through the main Postgres file, through this htup details file. Each time I indent, it means another level of include. So yeah, you can see like this one's like four levels deep, but becomes a hotspot because it was included in, in files that were hotspots up the chain. Some more, some more. So yeah. So how do you do actually the splitting of header files? Do you just like you have a tool for that? Do you look at unused header files or, or based on experience? Um, I think we have a tool that looks for unnecessary includes. Um, but besides that, it's a manual project. As far as I know. So, were there any other questions? And thanks again for inviting me to come out. This was an awesome opportunity. And one more time, there's a survey up there. <laughs> Thank you. So. so, the next session here will be at 5, and there will be 
the final, well, the announcement from Magnus, right? Did I get voted back in again or not? Hmm? Did I get voted back in again? <laughs> yeah. With elections results. Yeah. Well, this so thank you again, Shane. Thanks. So I'd actually completely forgotten about it. I need to be here for the next session. Um, if you want to run over and grab a fleece now, I can go right now. Um, even if you change the heavy that's a whole thing. Triple checking. <laughs> so what is it that you're? <laughs> this I have to trade to get on the I have this universal adapter. Many companies run the same as you have lots of, lots of tests, and as soon as you do something, you want to test. So, what do you do? You run, you're sure you test everything which takes ages? So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, well, we, it's been a lot more pronounced on certain platforms. Um, in particular, Solaris on Spark, we found has been very slow at running our regression suite. Um, so you, you were just asking what I, I do for, for my company. So we, uh, we're one of the first best to support them. Um, we're probably the largest one. We also take the, so we, we 
self support for community and high stress, but we take uh, a copy of the code for it and then add our compatibility um, and various other features. So we, we sell that as Postgres Plus and Dance Server um, and support that obviously, as well as supporting the community and high stress and obviously contributing to the community and providing installers free of charge for people, that sort of thing. Um, so our regression test suite for just the core database server for our server is based on the same framework as Postgres is, but where Postgres has got a few hundred tests in it, ours has got a few thousand, because we don't have the benefit of all the community looking at our Oracle credibility code, so we, you know, we test the crap out of it, basically. Um, um, and yeah, we found that that suite, the, there are certain things that we've not got to the point where we've invested a lot of time in trying to track down just yet, but we know there are hot spots in there which is on, on Solaris Spark in particular, it seems to be very slow, even on very expensive um, test machines, I don't mean expensive like a production server for a big website would do, you know, a, a sort of build and test machine that costs 40000 or something, it's fairly pricey. Uh, and, we, and we can, you know, on a, a £40,000 smart machine, have a regression test suite that takes 24 hours to run, that on Linux will run in eight hours. Um, and yeah, it's, it's some pretty bizarre... Some, some disk I.O. related or something? Yeah, like I say, it hasn't caused us enough problems yet that we've dived in that deeply. I mean, we, we've, sort of, we've done some basic instrumentation and narrowed it down to a few particular tests, but haven't actually come up with any real clues as to what the common factors are, if there are any that kind of yeah, thing. It's just, that's a huge thing. It seems, <laughs> seems to not be particularly efficient on that workload for some reason. Well, I never know, of course, if you have customers using that platform, then... Uh, yeah. We have customers using the platform, but they don't seem to run into the, any problems with it on production workloads. Because the regression test framework does a lot of things that you wouldn't necessarily do on a normal production system. Yeah, I see, yeah. Because it's doing different loads and things to try and, you know, uh, set up databases for tests that you're about to run, that sort of thing. Yeah, which sure. It's very random compared to what you might be running on an actual production system that's just doing the same thing, running the same web app or ERP system all the time. So, um, so, yeah, it's an interesting idea. Though. Sooner or later we're going to get to the point where our regression test suite is, even on the platforms where we don't have these problems, it's just going to take much longer to run than we want it to. Yeah, I, I never considered thinking about dependencies between the tests and the changes. The thing is, of course, yeah, like you can have dependencies, but then of course you need to maintain them as well. So you need to some some way which it's because if, if you like some uh, like your test has a new file, test files, some test script, and he has to figure out where he needs to put dependencies that slows him down, and then so you can have like, repercussions. Yeah, but, um, that would actually be kind of difficult for us because it's the the QA team that would actually develop tests based on bugs and feature requests that have gone in. But those guys wouldn't have any knowledge about how a particular feature was actually implemented. So they wouldn't... I imagine that would be quite a common problem in a software house where different sets of people doing the development to the actual... Like, Unless you can leverage like a dependency graph to kind of automatically have them and then say based on their include or something. Kind of I'm not sure how you'd figure out a direct relationship between it programmatically. Um, because we wouldn't want to exclude things like, for example, if you create a new test that was to test a specific aggregate that we'd added to the database server, you could very easily link that test and say, well, you know, only, only run this test if these three source files which implement that aggregate function 
of change. But actually, we tend to want to do more than that. We, we still want to be... We would want that test to be dependent on any other code paths that may have changed in the database. You know, the things that might call the aggregate function, bits of the planner that might figure out how to use differently within a query path. I imagine that might get quite tricky to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, profiling tools might help there. If you profile while running the test, you can see which functions are called. Uh, this is uh, still an interesting idea. Yeah. Run it a few times in different scenarios and see if, if you get some fairly stable results. Yeah. Start to take that as being a pretty good indicator of what matters. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've seen three, four talks today, and I can honestly say this one's given me the most to think about. So. Ah, cool. Yeah. Thanks for sticking around. I know you're thinking about uh, popping out. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Topic I've never seen that first question on before. I was a little nervous when we chose your talk, but I don't think we paid off. Ah, so. Thanks. Anyway. <coughs> so, do you have time to pop down now, or is it too late? Um, uh, so, Vic said he was going to wander down with you. I don't know where Yeah, he's right there. He's going to take some things back to the booth anyway. He knows where everything is. So. Um, yeah, we, we've got our election results, and I was standing for re-election, so I really wanted to be. Ah, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was only three of us running for three places, so I think it's a four cool <laughs> place. I still probably should be. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thanks again. Uh, thanks just that. We broke the elephant. Took a while. Yeah. It's on his way. There he is. Where is he? Yeah. <laughs> That's a we took a pause at the Mayas Gold Boot. He's probably welcomed by the Python. <laughs> It's not like it's not evil. It doesn't look like definition of a big evil. <laughs> That's okay. I'll guarantee you that I will not run over time for 45 minutes for this. You sure? Yes. So I thought that was an interesting thought. So, I'm not Uh, the approach they were taking. I mean, there were no surprises in the list of files. Did you get lost? No, but no, we didn't. Oh, everyone's here. Well, I assume Maya's there. Yeah, Maya's there and uh, Peter is there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was just saying, who won? Yeah, so am I. You think it'll take 50 40 years? No. It might take 10. Ah. But we don't stop. I'll get, oh, what? Everyone's here. <laughs> Everyone's not here. Oh, we have to, wait. We have to wait a lot of minutes. Yeah.
Just well, I mean, the previous sessions haven't actually finished yet. No, on paper. No. <laughs> Remind us of the cost I'm up to. Go to this talk. <laughs> okay, that's good to know. You gonna, Especially when you get it, huh? You're going to want that last bottle of water, Marcus. Uh, yes. Thanks for pointing out that there was a bottle of water there. If you just grabbed it, I would kind of get it. Well, it's not quite mugs or glasses or So I could pour some over in there. It's already in a semi-glass. Yeah, but for him. Still have to. We just want to charge. Do
Because everything just worked. Not for me. I had to switch. As I said. What services were you using? Quite shitty websites. Yes, <laughs> quite obviously. Signed up for the Postgres Europe membership. <laughs> My first reaction was, how did we get the email address out of the card machine? Turns out to use the website. Yeah. <clears throat> what do we call these? Bugs. Bugs. Yeah. Elephant bugs. Yeah. Not Postgres bugs, because Postgres doesn't have bugs. Yeah. Christoph told us that. <laughs> yeah, except one or two bugs in the application. Still the back This bug is like another guy used to work with this. But, but none of that was in stuff I did. <laughs> no. This time. So we were actually distributing bugs to them? Yeah. <laughs> What's wrong with this picture? Yeah, we couldn't fit the like, Trojan horses. There's one minute left. Let me people might be timing it. Let me sync my headlines. Let me sync my headlines. I don't care about you. <laughs> no, it's less than that. It's less than a minute. I'm waiting for Slonic. <laughs> We're supposed to stand in that corner and dance the whole time. We agreed on this. Better on clock size, it's five o'clock. Yeah. Go ahead.